Good afternoon, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you again on uh, uh, that uh, who is the first of a series of webinars for the International Society of uh, Gynecological Endocrinology. Is uh, uh, today we will have uh, a session with uh, where uh, uh, Professor Martin Birkhauser and Professor John Stevenson will be the singer of that fantastic uh, uh, song, which is the attention that we have uh, on the effects of continuous oral contraceptive and menopause hormone therapy on bone. Uh, the uh, first lecture is done by Professor Martin Birkhauser and who will be devoted to the continuous oral contraceptive effect and the effect on the bone mass. Just to introduce Martin Birkhauser, Martin Birkhauser is Professor Emeritus of the University of Bern in Switzerland. He has been head of the Division of Gynecological Endocrinology and Reproductive Medicine at the University of Bern until December 31st, 2008. His special research interests cover the field of menopause, osteoporosis, contraception, and women's health. And uh, his interest within the field of menopause is reflected by his research on postmenopausal changes of bone and of libis, the actual place of menopause hormone therapy, and the importance of quality of life for the postmenopausal women. He is a member of the board of the International Academy of Human Reproduction and treasurer of the International Society of Gynecology and Endocrinology. It has been member of the executive committee of the International Menopause Society, where he has held the position of treasurer from 2005 to 2008, and he was the founding president of the European Menopause and Andropause Society and of the Swiss Working Group of Organicological Endocrinology and Reproductive Medicine, and co-founder of the Swiss Association Against Osteoporosis. Then a lot of interest also in the bone area. Eh? He was a president of Swiss Menopause Society, the Swiss Association Against Osteoporosis, the Swiss Society of Contraception, and the Swiss Society of Endocrinology. He is honorary founding president of the European Menopause and Andropause Society, an honorary member of the International Menopause Society, an honorary president of the Turkish Menopause Society, and an honorary member of Menopause Society of Switzerland, Portugal, Romania, Hungary, and Chile. How, Martin? Now you have the microphone. Thank you, Andrea, for this kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be with you. Dear friends, dear colleagues, my mission is to speak today about the potential problems we might have with uh, contraception, hormone contraception on people mass. I have a window here. No, it's right here. So, now, uh, as I said before, I have no financial relationships to disclose. And as you remember well, the basic rule in medicine is the motto primum nil nocere. That means you never should harm your patient. And that is particularly important in healthy women using hormone contraceptives when alternatives could be chosen. Then you have to be very prudent to be sure that you don't harm your patients with the contraception. If you look at bone, it is a neglected organ in all reviews or nearly all reviews about hormone contraception. In the paper, 50 years of the pill, celebrating a gold anniversary, bone is not even mentioned. So the open questions in this paper, 50 years of the pill, is might hormone contraception have a negative impact on bone? And in particular, may HC use compromised acquisition of a normal people mass. We have no information in this review. The evidence available is poor if you want to answer this question. No RCTs have been done with fracture as an outcome. <laughs> no observational studies with fracture as a primary endpoint have been done. So our knowledge is based on surrogate parameters such as mainly BMD, and sometimes by chemical parameters, and on fracture risk evaluated as second or third endpoint only. There are some factors having a clear impact on bone. The first is a reduction in estrogen dose in the pill. Today we have pills containing only 20 or 50 micrograms of EE. Then the development of more selective progesterones 
with high anti philanthropic activity. For instance, desertine, desertestrel, nortestimate, clomadinone acetate, nomegestrol, dionogestrol, nestrone, you know them well. Then some changes in those regions have an impact, and, and that is very important, an endogenous factor, the stability of the gonadal axis. Let us go now to the importance of progestins for bone. Many contraceptives still use the classical and well-tolerated levonorgestrel, trailer, which has an androgenic partial activity. And this androgenic partial activity is welcome for bone. Newer progestins used for hormone contraception, I did not mention them, have an improved metabolic profile that is positive, but they have a loss of an androgenic partial activity and they have an anti gonadotrophic activity, what might be negative for bone and especially the requirement of people mass. And we have also stressed again, there is no class effect of gestins as many people still believe. Let us look now at the effect of low dose COX on bone in adolescence. There is a prospective controlled study in 370 adolescents published quite a number of years ago. They looked at the increase of bone mineral density and the mean age at baseline of the participants has been 16 years, the range 12 to 18 years. I show just the results. In at least long-term receipt of a low dose oral monophasic contraceptive formulation, it was a 20 micron pill, low significantly the increase in mean percent change in lumbar spine DMD compared with controls. You see, the difference was clearly significant. With 2.3% BMD gain in low dose COX 20 micron pill, uh, there was a significant inferior BMD increase compared to the increase seen in controls. A second study confirms these findings. This study shows a detrimental effect of COX on bone mass in a cohort of 248 young women, age 18 to 24 years. So a group before usually peak bone mass has been finally acquired. The pills used in the studies have been 20 to 30 microgram pills. If you go now to the left, you see the results for the controls, the PMD increase for controls, and the increase here for early starters and long users of these pills between 20 and 30 micrograms. These results show that early start long use leads to a significant lower BMD increase than controls. The third study is a two to three years follow-up in 122 adolescent women aged between 10, 12 and 19 years. They have been using different cocks, all have been below 35 micrograms E daily. The results show that the study revealed a significantly small BMD increase in mean adjusted lumbar and femoral BMD in COC users compared with non-users, again significant. Of this study, again, the conclusion was that low-dose E preparations suppress normal BMD accrual in adolescent women, leading to a decreased peak bone mass. Then we have a next study done in a population that has been slightly older, still young adult women, but up to 30 years. So it is a mixed population. Some of these women had already finished the acquirement of people, most others not. And again, we have a trend at the hip, difference was not significant, to a decreased BMD gain. At the spine, the same trend, but in both cases, the difference was not significant. So in this mixed population, the same hint that peak bone mass will be decreased if you use low-dose COX in young women. And finally, we have the meta-analysis shown here, published in 2019. The aim of the study was to look at the 12 months weighted mean difference in mean absolute change from baseline in gram per centimeter for spinal aerial BMD in adolescent, in, uh, in adolescent combined hormonal contraceptive users versus non-users. There have been, again, the use of different pills with different eastern contents and different progestins, but the result is concordant with what we have seen until now. 
the users had a clearly lower EMD than the non-users. And again, that was significant. What do we know about track risks? All data we have seen until now have been BMD risks, so uh, surrogate parameter. Do we have any fracture data in this special population? The only publication has been the Cochrane analysis I show you here from 2015. In this Cochrane analysis, 553 studies have been screened, but only 14 could be included, seven case control and seven port studies, no RCT. The contraceptives examined have been the COX, DEPO MPA, and intrauterine devices charged by a hormonal active principle. But finally, only six out of 553 studies on all contraceptives provided moderate or high quality evidence. So the evidence shown in this COX analysis again is quite weak. What do we know about these COC users? Only one cohort study had a look at fracture risk in young women. And this study, again, uh, let, let us suppose that younger users have a higher fracture risk, and that is important with the PM data we have seen before. However, in this COC analysis, no sub analysis has been done for the consequences of a low people mass on fracture risk. So, in fact, we don't have really reliable fracture data to answer this question. But then we have a lot of missing data. We have no reliable data uh, today in the in adolescents for the effect on bone in use of combined battery rings and combined contraceptive patches, except for a pilot study you will see soon. And we have no data in COX with natural E2 or with estetrol. You know that these two kinds of pills aim at a lower risk due to a better metabolic profile, but no fracture data available and no reliable BMD data are available too. So we cannot make any statement for the Mormonon pills. Here you see the data uh, with the EVRA patch. You have on the left side, the person change the total body mineral content as a function of time. On the right side, the lumbar spine bone mineral density as a function of time. For both parameters, you have an increase of PMD, a normal increase in controls, and no increase or a nearly absent increase for the EVA users. That shows us that EVA, the patch, is not the alternative for COX if you would like to avoid a comprom compromission of people mass in young, adult, young women. What do you know about progesterone only contraceptives from bone? We have again the same questions. Should there be uh, special behavior to avoid uh, to have a reduced people mass? We have another publication looking at the safety of EMP in adults, published by Gabriela Merki. It was a prospective longitudinal study over an interval of 12 months. Uh, they looked in this study on the effect of depo MPA on trabecular and portable bone after attainment of people mass. So the study has been done in adults. It will not answer any questions. But the study at that time led to the conclusion that there is no negative impact of the MPA on the bone mass of premenopausal women aged 30 to 45 years. Unfortunately, many people uh, believed that DMPA is safe in all women, not only in adult women at that time. Uh, and they missed the fact there has been no sub-analysis for vulnerable subgroups. What can we say today? A three-year longitudinal follow-up study has been conducted in women aged 16 to 33, uh, 33 years by Berenson. And this study gives a strong evidence from these data demonstrating that DMPA compromised BMD in current users. DMP users lost 3.7% BMD in the spine and 5.2% in the femoral neck compared with BMD increases in all controls. And this study had deduced that the loss was greatest in younger users, 60 to 24 years. But again, there has been no sub-analysis for adolescents. 
Then we have this study. It was a case control study based on UK GPRD data. Uh, the authors looked at over more than 17,000 incident fracture cases and more than 70,000 control patients. The adjusted odds ratio for fractures was for current use for a short time, 1.818, not significant. And for current use of 10 or more BMPA prescription, 1.54, and that was taken significant. So we conclude from this uh, study that DMP use is associated with increased risk of fractures for all women in all groups of age. Fracture risk was highest after long treatment duration. That's the second conclusion. And there was no difference in patients between less than 30 years and above 30 years of age. Unfortunately, there was no split for adolescents. Uh, I do not know why. Perhaps the data didn't allow it because they have been not enough young women included in this analysis. Again, the Cochrane uh, results from 2015 about the fracture risk, what do we know for persistent only principles. So the first study of these two case control studies accepted for the analysis showed that every use has an increased odds ratio to have fractures, and that was significant. And if you have a long-term use for more than four years, this odd ratio increases and becomes clearly statistically significant. Uh, so this study allows to tell that there is an increased factor risk for all groups of ages in users of MPA. The second study confirmed this data. If you use at the current use of 10 or more prescriptions, the odds ratio was at 1.54 and again significant. So MPA is an increased risk for fractures, and in particular, as all studies have shown until now, is an increased risk for young women too. Do we know anything about the order the MPA preparation containing 104 milligrams retainlessly? We have no data, especially not in the reasons. And then an interesting result came out of this Cochrane analysis, that is the data with the Levonorgestrel releasing IEDs, only one study has to be confirmed, but it looks as if the use of a Levonorgestrel releasing IED would reduce the fracture risk. For every use and longer use, the odds ratio came down to 0.75, and that was significant. So we also think that that might be a good alternative for the young women at an increased risk of a compromised peak bone mass. And this is confirmed by an old study looking at BMD gain with levonorgestrel implants. And uh, this has been compared to depomidoxifos and acetate, uh, the classical DMPA injection. As we see on the slide, if you use the implant with levonorgestrel, you have an increase of BMD, a positive change. If you go to the DEPA-MPA, we have what we know already now. We have no increase or even a trend to a decrease that was not significant. So levonorgestrel in implants and in IEDs might be a positive choice. We have no information of desogestrel tablets. Until now, no epidemiologic data been published. The product information of Z states that it leads to reduced isodial serum level, and this level corresponds to that of the early follicular phase. So far, it is unknown whether this decrease has a clinical relevant effect on bone marrow density and deposition of a normal peak bone mass in young adolescent girls. Question remains open. We have no information either about ethanol implants. As you see in here, at the beginning, these implants release quite a considerable amount of ethanol The evidence available does not allow to draw any conclusion about the long-term effect of these implants on fracturated and adult users. And no data are available for fracture risk or peak bone mass in other lesions. We don't know. We have no information if it's allowed to use the implants in women between 12 and 19 years.
I come to the conclusions. We have seen that there are several critical factors if we look at the relation between hormone conception and bone adolescence. Newer studies suggest that the influence of different contraceptives on female bone is closely related to the age at the start of intake, the type and the dose of the estrogen used, the persistent added, duration of the therapy, and the endogenous factor, the stability of the brain axis. And you have to recognize we have no fractured data for the reasons. The estrogenic activity in COX users is parted in two. The total activity is the sum of the remaining endogenous E2 and the exogenous estrogen activity delivered by the pill. That means if low dose COX leads to an oversuppression of the hypothalamal hypophysal gonadal axis due to progestins, the low, the total estrogen activity will go down. The consequence in women with unstable cycles, low dose COX may lead to low endogenous estrogen levels. It's sufficient for the acquisition of a normal peak bone mass and for the maintenance of a normal bone in adults with an unstable cycle. The effect of the different progestins in use on bone is summarized here. Different progestins vary in the effects on bone, as we have seen. And noetisterone acts through EE on bone. Noetisterone is partially converted into estrogen and it is estrogen is potentially bone sparing. So noetisterone is, if you look at bone, one of the only positive progestins used in the pill today. The effect of COX and DMP on bone is summarized here. Overall evidence from observational studies does not indicate an association between COX use and factor risk, if you look at all groups of ages together, but low dose COX may lead to reduced peak bone mass if used at adolescence and to a decrease in BMT in young adults having still unstable cycles. DMPA has a negative impact on BMD in women of all ages, DMPA users may have an increased factor risk, and DMPA leads to a reduced peak bone mass is used, used in adolescents and young adults. Inversely, hormone IOD use could be associated with a decreased factor risk. To summarize and to give some recommendations, in adolescents, the classical 30 to 35 micron Cox are safe for the acquisition of a normal peak bone mass. 15 to 20 micron Cox should not be used in young women until stable overall cycles are reached. DMPA should be avoided in adolescence before peak bone mass is acquired. Initiation of DMPA within the first three years after menarche is of particular concern. Therefore, DMPA should remain a reserve medication where no alternative is possible. For other hormonal contraceptive methods, good evidence is missing and is not known if their use in adolescent girls is safe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for this beautiful lecture. And I'm sure this will raise a lot of questions after. And then now I would like to move to the presentation of Professor John Stevenson. <clears throat> John Stevenson is Emeritus Reader in Metabolic Medicine in the National Heart and Lung Institute, Imperial College in London, and visiting professor at the Belgrade School of Medicine, and consultant physician at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, where he jointly runs the United Kingdom first female heart disease clinic. His research has included studies of metabolic risk factor for coronary heart disease and the effect of sex hormone deficiency and replacement and the metabolic bone disease, particularly the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of osteoporosis. He lectured extensively throughout the world and has over 450 publications in journals and books, including 12 textbooks. He's the chairman of the Charity Women's Health Concern Trustee of the British Menopause Society, Fellow of the European Society of Cardiology, Foundation Member of the Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine in UK, and Executive Committee Member of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. I thank you 
John, and he's the past chairman of the British Menopause Society and past executive committee member of the International Menopause Society and of the European Menopause and Andropause Society, past non-US section head, cardiovascular disease in women, and the Women's Health Faculty, Faculty of Thousand Medicine, and past editor of Maturitas. And today, he will delight us with a fantastic lecture of menopause hormone therapy and the bone, and with a lot of concern related not only to the bone, but in general to the uh, female body, female organs, female tissue, and sensitivity to estrogen. Please, John, you have the microphone, and then later on we will have a full discussion together. And I invite all the people to send their question through the question and answer. You have to go on it, and you can write your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you for asking me to take part in this uh, webinar. So I'm going to talk about HRT and fracture prevention. And what I want to show is that... Uh, it's not just effects on bone because we have a number of agents that will be good for preventing bone fractures, but also HRT has extra uh, beneficial effects that the other alternatives don't have. Oops. These are my disclosures. So if you look at... Uh, Osteoporotic fractures, what determines whether you're going to get an osteoporotic fracture? Obviously, reduced bone mass is an important thing, but also increased bone turnover, because that can lead to the destruction of the underlying microtexture, microarchitecture of bone tissue. And the clinical consequence of this, of course, is fracture. Now, this study from a series uh, from a number of years ago was looking at bone density in its relation to fractures, fracture rates and numbers of fractures. So what you see, if you look at the gold columns, these are the fracture rates, and on the bottom axis, you're looking at bone mineral density T-scores. So you can see that with the lower the T-score, the greater the rate of fracture, which is what we would expect. But if you look at the blue bars, light blue bars, they're showing the actual numbers of fractures that are occurring. And the greatest number of fractures is actually occurring in patients with T-scores that we would say use, classifies them as osteoporosis, an osteopenia rather than osteoporosis. So in other words, although the greatest risk is in those with the, the most severe osteoporosis, the biggest number of fractures occurs in those with osteopenia. So obviously it's not just bone density that is determining whether or not you get a fracture. So reduced bone density can result in osteoporotic fracture, that's obvious. Vertebral fracture is a common osteoporotic fracture. But it has been calculated that reduced bone density, just on its own, accounts for less than 30% of the fracture risk. So there have to be other factors involved. And I'm going to just try and summarize some of those. So besides bone density, there are other things to take into consideration. Now, the menopause is very important in terms of skeletal health and fracture risk. But I'm going to look at the effects of menopause not only on bone density, but also to look at the effect of menopause on muscle loss and also their effects on intervertebral discs, which I hope I'll show can be also very important. Let's start by looking at the effects of menopause and mineral density. The loss of ovarian function in menopause uh, has a profound effect on bone. These are very old data from our group looking at pre and post menopausal women, and this is spinal bone density. And you can see looking at the pre menopausal women that peak bone mass is achieved fairly early on. It's achieved soon after the end of skeletal uh, growth, and it stays fairly steady until you get to menopause, loss of ovarian function results in a sharp decline in bone density, which may persist for several years. 
um, and accelerating beyond that. Mm -hmm. So I'll carry on, and this is showing, having shown you the effects of bone, uh, menopause on bone density, we're now looking at the effects of hormone replacement therapy. And these are studies from our group uh, showing the effects of two different forms of HRT. The gold bar, the gold line bar, is showing the effects of oral HRT, and the light blue line is showing the effects of transdermal HRT. And this is a randomized study, but there was an untreated uh, reference group, control group, shown by the red line. So you can see that over this three year period, untreated postmenopausal women are losing bone, but with both forms of HRT, they are preventing that bone loss and showing a small increase as well. And there is no difference between the oral or the transdermal therapy. And if you look at the optimal femur, the same thing. The red line showed the loss in the untreated control group. The two HRT regimens showing again prevention of that bone loss. Um, and a small increase, and no difference again between either of the administration. So this just shows us that if you give hormone replacement therapy by whatever means, you're going to get a beneficial effect on the skeleton. This is a, another study that we did, this time looking at oral estradiol and looking at the effects of two different doses. So this was a study of a couple of hundred postmenopausal women randomized to estradiol, one milligram or two milligrams, plus digestosterone or to placebo. And looking at the lumbar spine, you can see the placebo group is shown by the light blue line, losing bone over the two-year study period, whereas the two estrogen doses are both preventing that bone loss. And certainly you can see that the higher dose, the two milligram line shown by the green line, is slightly better than the one milligram dose is shown by the purple line. And if we plot a dose response curve, then you can see that those two doses of estradiol are actually quite close to the top of the dose response curve. And what this means is that perhaps with an even smaller dose, 0.5 milligrams of oral estradiol, we would still be getting conservation of bone density. So that's showing bone density, but what about fractures? Because obviously fractures is the important endpoint. This is the data from the Women's Health Initiative from the estrogen plus progestogen arm of this study. Over 16,500 postmenopausal women are randomized to either HRT or to placebo age between 50 and 80 years. And what it's showing is that you get a significant reduction with the HRC in both hip fractures, in spine fractures, and indeed all other fractures. So this is giving us good evidence that the bone density changes that we saw do translate into a reduction in fractures. And this population would not an osteoporotic population yeah, but probably a lot of them would have been osteopenic, and so this is clearly a very beneficial effect. And finally, a tiny dose of transdermal estradiol, 14 micrograms, are being delivered by this patch. And what this study from America showed was that, even though there were small numbers, that there was a significant reduction in fractures with this ultra-low dose transdermal estradiol compared with placebo. And this was a study that was conducted in, in women uh, above the age of 70. So they are fairly low in terms of their bones. And lastly, a study from uh, Klaus Christiansen's group in Denmark. And here they did a number of uh, Randomized clinical trials looking at the effects of different forms of HRT on bone density measurements. And these women were in their early postmenopausal years. But having taken part in these studies, 
for two, two or three years. years. They were then followed up for up to 15 years. Uh, and the women that have never had any subsequent HRT or other bone sparing therapies uh, were compared. And so now, uh, aged around 65, you can see that those women who were initially randomized to HRT compared with those randomized to placebo, the HRT group have got a significant reduction in all fractures and indeed a significant reduction in spine fractures. So this at least suggests that perhaps treating for a few years around the time of menopause with HRT will result in a fairly long-lasting benefit to the skeleton. So just looking at the effect of the bone density of estrogen loss and estrogen replacement, and there's no doubt uh, that HRT is highly effective in preventing and treating postmenopausal bone, uh, bone loss and osteoporosis. So now I want to look at the effects of loss of estrogen on muscle. So muscle mass and bone mass are quite well correlated. This is a very early study we did looking at total body calcium by neutron activation analysis and total body potassium, which reflects total muscle mass. And you can see there's a good correlation between the two. And we know that it's important to have good muscle mass if you're going to have good bone mass. And this is an interesting study where they were looking at uh, measuring the muscle power in men and women. And so on this graph, the light blue line is showing the effect of muscle power in men, the change over time is, is a percentage of their muscle power. And you can see that really there's very little change in, over these years in men. But if you look at the green line, this is the effect in postmenopausal, in premenopausal women. And so they're showing also really very little change with aging. But once they go through the menopause, as shown by the red line, there is this clear decline in muscle power. And this decline in muscle power is certainly going to increase the risk of sustaining a fracture. And they also looked then at the effects of in muscle power, the effects of HRT. So in this chart here, on the, the, the light blue column is showing the muscle power in premenopausal women, the red column showing the uh, muscle power in postmenopausal women, which is significantly lower than in premenopausal women. And then you've got the effects of HRT, which is really restoring the muscle power to that of a premenopausal woman. And of course, with the estrogen, you've not only got muscle effects, but you also have beneficial locomotor effects, which are actually going to help reduce the risk of falls. So these are going to be important in terms of, again, reducing the risk of fracture. And lastly, I want to look at the effects of menopause and hormone replacement on intervertebral discs in the spine. So intervertebral discs, we can think of as acting like shock, shock absorbers in the spine. And there's the as we age, the disc gets thinner and stiffer, and so their shock absorbability is reduced. And loss of intervertebral disc height may, for those reasons, well predispose to vertebral fracture. Now, loss of intervertebral disc height occurs with the aging process, but also loss of intervertebral disc height occurs with menopause. And these are data from my friend and colleague, Professor Mark Brinkat in Malta, where they looked at measuring intervertebral disc height in over a thousand patients. Uh, and what we've got here is, on the left-hand side of the, the, the diagram, the effect of postmenopausal women who are taking calcium, effects of postmenopausal women taking bisphosphonates, and then menopausal women. And you can see that the menopausal women have got significantly less or lower disc heights 
that in the premenopausal women are shown on the right here. And neither of the calcium or bisphosphonate treatments help to change that lower disc height. But when you look on the right hand side of the slide, the effect of giving HRT to postmenopausal women again is restoring the disc height to that of a premenopausal woman. So a very beneficial effect here. This is a big, big cross-sectional study. We decided to try and look longitudinally to see if we could compare them and, and, and uh, confirm these findings. So we undertook a study. Um, this was uh, taking uh, data from a big study that we had done, uh, of which I showed you the bone density measurements, looking at two doses of the estradiol plus digestrone or placebo. And this was a study of the over 570 postmenopausal women from whom the, the uh, bone density measurements, we were actually extracted 74 postmenopausal women uh, who were all healthy, who had bone density measurements from which we could actually measure this height. So the bone density was measured by DEXA measurements, and we used the ruler on the DEXA machine to actually measure disc height. And we measured the disc between D12 and L1, L1 to L2, and L2 to L3. So we've got three disc heights which we combined, and the precision of the measurements was around about 10%. So these are the findings over the two-year study period. On the right-hand side, the red columns show placebo with no statistically significant change in this height during the study period. But on the right-hand side, combining the uh, HRT groups, you can see that there is a significant increase in the intervertical disc height with the HRT. So within groups, there is a significant change with HRT. Between the two groups, these changes were not statistically significant. And when we looked at the uh, individual groups, the red column showing placebo, the pale green column here showing one milligram of estradiol, and the brighter green column showing two milligrams of estradiol. And although this did not quite reach statistical significance, I think it's suggesting that we've got a bit of a dose effect happening here. And certainly, I think these data are confirming the findings of Mark Brinkett and his colleagues. So in conclusion, what I hope I've shown you is that HRT reduces osteoporotic fracture risk because it has major beneficial effects on bone density. It prevents postmenopausal bone loss and it does this as effectively as any other currently available agent. But in addition, uh, HRT also prevents postmenopausal loss of muscle power, and it prevents loss of intervertebral disc heights. And both these will help contribute to the reduction in fractures that we see with this treatment. And no other anti-fracture treatment has all these effects. And because of this, I still conclude that in terms of the prevention of postmenopausal osteoporosis, HRT remains our first line treatment of choice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, <clears throat> for that uh, very convincing lecture. <clears throat> Thank you also. Martin, can you come again? We, have, uh, we can start uh, the, the discussion session. And I'm then here. can you open your, uh, okay, also your video. Thank you. Okay, we have received uh, a series of questions on both topics. And uh, I would like to start uh, with Martin and then we will follow on. Uh, first of all, Sergio Brantes from Chile. I welcome him. He writes many thanks, Dr. Birkhauser. My question is about the switch from Itinis Estradio 0.3 formulation to Itinis Estradio 0.2. When regular cycles are achieved, it is a matter of years of use of age or age, or you recommend suspending the COC at a given moment to know the spontaneous cyclicity. Please, can you, can you respond to this one? Uh, hello, Sergio. How are you? Just to precise, uh, the question is if um, I can continue with the 
30 micron pills, if the cycles are uh, unstable, is that the question? If the fat is a question, I say yes, then you can continue. <clears throat> but if a patient has uh, unstable cycles, annulation, then I think we should use the 30 and not the 20 micron pill. Thank you. And then now one for uh, John Stevens. John, it's also on the dosage of estrogen. You, know, you mentioned <clears throat> that uh, the hormone therapy is efficient to prevent uh, bone mass density loss. And you have also shown your data about your personal data about the use of one or two milligram estradiol together with the uh, hydrogesterone. But the question is, is uh, the dose of estrogen important of any age? As the menopause take care around 50s, but the women aging processes until 90s, until, until the end of the life. Uh, is the estrogen dose important at any age or eventually what kind of attention we have to take care really in relation of the age of the patients and the dose of estrogen use? Yes, thank you. Um, certainly we've been able to show that uh, younger women uh, require probably a higher dose of estrogen than older women in order to conserve bone mass. Or to put it the other way, the older the woman gets, the less estrogen she actually needs to be able to get that beneficial effect on bone density. And indeed, we show, I showed you the data from the United States showing that just that tiny dose of transdermal estradiol, 14 micrograms, was sufficient to cause fracture reduction in women in their 70s and 80s. So these are the older women. So I would say, yes, you can probably reduce the estrogen dose as the woman gets older. Certainly, if you're starting an older woman on estrogen, we would always say start on a much lower dose anyhow for safety reasons. And the opposite is true as well, that young women with premature ovarian insufficiency are going to probably need a higher dose of estrogen in order to get the maximum benefits. We had a special question. Thank you for that one. It's a better uh, special question that uh, was also chosen by another participant. And then for Martin, what about adult women? Can we consider low dose pills to be safe for bone? Yes, we can if this woman has a stable cycle. But as soon as there is an oversuppression of the gonadal axis, through to endogenous factors combined with the pill, then we shouldn't use all those pills, but the classical 30 macro pills. Thank you. And then now, uh, Christina Toa was the person who was asking us about uh, the premature ovarian failure uh, use. And, uh, but now, Natalia Atalla, this is for John, is the beneficial effect is from the estrogen only or androgen play men part, especially on the muscle power, and hence, should testosterone replacement to be an essential constituent of hormone replacement therapy? Yes, indeed. Um, <clears throat> there's no doubt that testosterone will have beneficial effects on both bone density uh, and on muscle. Uh, absolutely no doubt about that at all. But I don't think that we need to always combine testosterone with estrogen in every postmenopausal woman. And so I would say you only need to add testosterone if there are other reasons as well, such as loss of libido, uh, possibly um, generalized fatigue. I think if you've got evidence of testosterone deficiency, it's very important to add testosterone, and that is only going to benefit the skeleton and the muscle mass. Uh, but I don't think we need to be giving it that specifically just for those purposes. Thank you. And I would like also to add some comment about DHEA. As you know, we are using also a lot of DHEA in addition to menopause hormone therapy because they have lost also that major precursor of both androgen and estrogen. And then I would like, uh, I will, uh, I would like also to add a consideration of the possibility to integrate uh, DHEA also in women who have a special reduction of endogenous DHEA sulfate as this can be also an important factor for the bone uh, structure organization. And then and then now a, a question for a question for Martin, uh, still on that line. Eh? 
Should we use in adolescents combined contraceptive methods without solid data on bone, such as vaginal ring? That is a difficult question. I would say no. Thank you. Uh, you have no data. <laughs> Please, can you make a comment about that point? Because you know it's something that uh, uh, it's something that we are uh, supporting, and also I would like to that the people, that our public, will be aware of your beliefs. Well, you know the problem is if you use a method without any proofs that uh, peak bone mass will not be compromised, we take some risk. And as we have seen for the era patch, an alternative that is not going to the stomach. Uh, this era patch and thermal patch, of course, is compromising peak bone mass. So we cannot be sure that the vaginal ring is not compromising either the peak bone mass in young women between, let us say, uh, menarche and 20 years. We have no idea. So if I want to be sure, for instance, if I have a family with a familiar increased risk of osteoporosis, I would avoid it. Thank you. And then now Apostolos Campagiannis is asking to John a question for you. Is there a window of opportunity for menopause hormone therapy for osteoporosis and sarcopenia? And can menopause hormone therapy be used for osteoarthritis in women 60, 50, 60 years of age? Okay, the, I'm not sure there's a window of opportunity um, in terms of preserving bone mass, I mean, obviously, the sooner after menopause you go on to HRC, the, the less bone you will have lost, and therefore you will be conserving more of the bone mass. But in terms of the response, I don't think there is a window of opportunity. And for muscle, we, we just do not know. In terms of arthritis, it's an interesting one because there is some evidence that estrogen may actually have beneficial effects in terms of preventing or limiting the development of osteoarthritis. And that's been shown in a few studies. And also it's been shown that estrogen, of course, does affect collagen deposition and maintaining collagen health, which may well help to prevent the development of osteoarthritis. So it's certainly something worth thinking about. At the present time, I don't think anybody is specifically giving estrogen purely for prevention of osteoarthritis. But if you're giving estrogen, you could always say this could well be an added bonus. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. And then now we have two questions, Martin, on the new on the novelties in contraception. One is from Deborah Jankovic. Any info about uh, uh, progesterone only contraception, the withdrawal of four milligram and the bone. And the second is from Raymond Lee. Is there any bone effect data with estetol containing the COC or HRT? Well, it is a pity we don't have the data until now. And uh, same problem as you have the vaginal ring. And I think it would be the responsibility of the producers to make these studies. Is we have to be sure what happens in young women, and we don't. So, um, as I hinted at before, if you are treating a young patient belonging to a family at high risk for osteoporosis, we shouldn't use yet these novelties. It is a pity, but I, it is a cry for help to the industry to do these studies. Thank you very much. And then, third Nessen, uh, a question for you, uh, John. Bone mass density accounts for less than 30% of fracture. Usually a fold is required for non-spine fracture. In the range of postural balance with increasing age, menopause hormone therapy might improve postural balance, at least partially, a brain effect and possibly reduce fracture risk. As you know, I am delighted when we speak about brain effect of menopause hormone therapy. Please, can you make a comment? Because this is something also very important because uh, uh, the, the, to crash, uh, to, uh, to have a fracture is also important to failing, falling down. And to falling down is the reaction time of muscular structure, which is important to counteract. Please. Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. And I mentioned in my talk that not only when we were looking at the effects on muscle, but also the study showed that the effects on locomotor systems and brain effects are going to improve balance. 
and they're going to reduce the risk of falling. You know, the fact that, that each gym is having a positive effect on the brain is also probably going to make reaction times quicker so that they're going to be able to avoid tripping and falling. Uh, and so I'm quite sure that the, the brain contribution uh, is, is important in terms of risk of fracture and that estrogen's effect on the brain is important in terms of reducing the risk of fracture. That's got to be a good part of the mechanism as well. Thank you very much. And now, Martin, Raymond Lee also writes another question, I think an really interesting one. If for young hypogonadal women, such women with premature ovarian insufficiency or hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, we have to remember that one. What do you think is the optimal dose of estradiol in EHASKI, in hormone replacement therapy, but in, hypo in hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, also in, uh, in uh, contact? Con mm. Con therapies who need also a contraceptive protection? Well, that is a data where evidently we don't have data, but to speculate, I would say in these very special cases, we could add a transdermal patch to the contraception, a patch that is able to guarantee the minimal E2 amount that these women need. So why not combine the contraceptive principle with a patch of 50 micrograms E2. That would be a solution, but I have no data for that. And just to add another point, that is, we are a little bit marching on our own feet, right? Because if you look at the reason why we have such a lack of data in young women, part of it is due to the legislation that doesn't allow to do studies to the industry in women below the age of 18 years in many countries. So we have to find a way out of this dilemma, otherwise we'll never get the data. Thank you. And now, Georgios Adonakis, I have a question for you, John. Professor Stevenson, could you please explain more on the mechanism of estrogen, of estrogen action on DISC-8? Yeah, the effect on the, on the DISC is basically it affects um, on uh, the collagen, uh, elastin, and amino glycans in the disc. So it's a direct effect of estrogen. That's the, the mechanism why, whereby it helps to preserve um, uh, the, the discs. And of course, it helps to preserve the water content in the disc, which is what gives it uh, its important anti shock absorber effects. Um, and it's the loss of water through the disc that makes them shrink with age. So those are the mechanisms directly whereby each of will affect the disc. Thank you. And then now a question, uh, Martin, for you from Cristina Benetti Pinto. This is an interesting question. Professor, could the continuous use of pills, you know, we have continuous pills, have a smaller reduction on bone mass density? I'm convinced that it is the case, that we don't have to study this again. But that could be a solution to decrease the potential risk. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, now for uh, John, uh, yes, uh, Barbara Herans, uh, she make a question again. And you know, we have a lot of questions. It's an attractive webinar. It's a pleasure for the ISG to organize uh, events to attract our, our participants to put their question and to discuss open as we are normally in clinics. And Barbara, she asked, thank you for your presentation. As mentioned, Bosman density accounts for 30% of fracture risk. In this sense, what is your opinion on the correlation between the detrimental effect of oral, contrac of oral contraceptives on uh, uh, bone peak mass and the risk of fracture later in life and menopause? So, so I'm not quite sure I understood that question. Could you just say it again? Yes, okay. She asked, uh, uh, starting from the observation that Bosman density accounts for 30% of fracture risk, uh, what is your opinion in the correlation between the detrimental effect of oral contraceptive on bone mass and the risk of fracture later in life and in menopause? They, there is a connection between yeah. the use and the greater fragility after menopause. Well, there will be because Basically, if anything that reduces your adult peak bone mass before the menopause is going to result in a greater risk of fracture after the menopause. In other words, you're starting with less money in the bank when you start to spend money 
after the men go through the menopause. So the lower your adult peak bone mass, the bigger the risk there will be for uh, future osteoporosis when you have the inevitable postmenopausal bone loss. Yes, I mean, uh, 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 Jeff, I mean, I, yes, I have seen a study, I can't remember the name of the author today, but this study looked at the consequences of uh, low dose pill uh, used by young women 10 years later. And 10 years later, these women had an increased risk of fracture. Yes, and then this going uh, response that we have to take care of that one. And also then, then we have a question for you, uh, Martin, from Chris Creatura. What about the use of anti-androgens in adolescence for treatment of acne? Does oh, it have some effect on bone mass density and the peak bone mass? Please comment. Well, um, I remember I've seen one study only uh, recently about the consequence of a combination of EE and cyprine acetate in young women. And there was a decrease of peak bone mass. Thank you. And then, uh, John, uh, Sergio, I've put a question who pushed us uh, to uh, some reflections. I will read for you. Eh? Thank you very much, Dr. Stevenson. The efficacy of hormone replacement therapy to reduce fracture is independent of symptoms. That is, effective in patients without symptoms as well. Would it be appropriate to promote hormone replacement therapy among all women who do not have contraindication in order to prevent skeletal health, at least in their first 10 postmenopausal years? Some guidelines limit the indication to the presence of symptoms, reducing the number of women who can be effectively benefited. Please make a comment. Yes, um, at the moment, um, we still can give uh, hormone replacement therapy for the prevention of postmenopausal bone loss, but the regulatory authorities class it as second line therapy. To my mind, that is completely wrong. Um, I don't think we should give all women uh, hormone replacement therapy just to preserve their skeletons, because not every woman is going to get on and develop postmenopausal osteoporosis. So you'll be treating quite a sensible proportion of them unnecessarily. Um, so I think that we have to be selective in our cases, but where there is just a bone indication where you've got somebody who you perceive or you can show is an increased risk for developing osteoporosis in the future, postmenopausal women, I think it is absolutely justifiable to give HRT solely for that reason, if even if she's completely asymptomatic. Okay. Then I, now it's a uh, question. Uh, I, I will read what Moira Stein writes uh, with on uh, continuous oral contraceptive, and then I would like that to comment about that one, Martin. Certainly, the benefits of the COC outweigh the risk of bone density, decreases the risk of ovarian and uterine cancer. Please, make, can you make a comment? Because this is not only related to outweigh the risk of one or the other, but or to see the more appropriate uh, contraceptive that will have to be used at any age, at any condition for any patient. And eventually, as Professor Vircasa was telling us, to, uh, to use a contraceptive, but to rise the estrogenization of the individual with more amount of transcutaneous estradiol. Please, can you comment about that one, Martin? That is a horrible question because. Uh, it, in a way, it would demand data we don't have. So we can only uh, make a general recommendation. I think I want us to try to find the essential risk for the concrete patient sitting before us. So if the risk is not the bone, the main risk of this patient, what we said now might be neglected because other points are more important. If this patient, for instance, has a um, a special risk of uterine cancer, so why not, and metal cancer, then bone is not the first point you should look at. And then you have to choose another way. So I think we have to individualize uh, the contraception too. And perhaps you should uh, use more frequently in such cases, in metal cancer risk, etc., more the intrauterine IUD delivering levonorgestrel acetate. 
because there we have two things at the same time. We have the protection of the individual and we have the whole protection, if that was the question. Thank you. Then we have uh, one question that probably, John, I don't know, each one, who of you can answer. This is from uh, our friend Slavko Kamenov. He thanks for excellent lecture. And then he put the question, how to evaluate Bosman density of trans women? We have to evaluate them in comparison to the gender structure of the bone or to the perceived, uh, perceived sex. Can, how you can, each one, one of you can answer to that question? I mean, my thought would be that you would have to compare them to the density of their original their biological gender. So that even if they have, you know, they, they become transsexual, you still need to evaluate the skeleton according to their, you know, whether they've got two X chromosomes or an XY chromosome, because there are de de definitely differences between men and women in terms of the skeletal development. So I, that's the way I would interpret that. I've, I've never had to do it, so, and I don't know if any studies really looking at that. But that would be my reaction. If I may come in too, we did a small series of controls of BMD in transsexual women, being now men. And what we have seen there, but it's a small series, that we can main have female normal values, but we can never reach the male normal values. Thank you. Yes, this is the question that in fact uh, Zravko was raising. And then now, I think I would like, uh, we are at the end, and I would like to ask uh, each one of you to make uh, a general comment based on his lecture, on the quality of question coming out, and if you have any uh, final, uh, uh, any final uh, comment and suggestion that you would like to give to our public, because they're still now, they're all present. Then we start uh, with Martin, and then we follow with John. Martin. Well, I did like the discussion. It was highly interesting and very good questions have been asked. If I may come back to my main sorrow, we don't have the data we need in young women. So I would like if national societies could do some studies in their countries uh, by uh, daring to study women between, or let's say the girls and the leases, between 12 and 20 years to see what comes out with the different principles we discussed today, especially the new principles and the vaginal being the E2, natural E2 preparations and the E4 preparation. There we need data. And we can only get it if our national societies are making an effort. Thank you very much. John. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd like to thank the participants for their um, involvement and the questions have been excellent. And it's very encouraging that people are showing such a, a good interest and a good understanding of the subjects, and it's really, really good. Um, and my, I suppose my, my heartfelt uh, plea uh, in terms of my talk will be HRT for prevention of the postmenopause and osteoporosis. It is first line. Please, with the regulatory authorities, pay some attention. Absolutely, thanks. And I would like, first of all, I would like to remind to everybody that uh, our uh, webinar will remain available on the will remain available on the web and then on our uh, ISG activity. I would like to remind to all of you that the 16th of uh, November, Tuesday, we have the next ISG webinar, which will be devoted to the sexuality and gynecological endocrinology with two leaders in that topic, the charming Rosella Nappi with sexuality in women with premenstrual syndrome and our chief editor of gynecological endocrinology, Peter Chadrawi on evaluation of sexuality in mid-aged women. And then I would like to invite all of you to join and remind you 
that we have our World Congress of Gynecological Endocrinology 11 to 14 of May 2022. You can start sending an abstract. We have beautiful scholarship and we, the Congress will be fantastic. And we wish all it will be COVID free. And I wish to all of you a healthy time for you and your family. And I thank Martin Binkhauser, John Stevenson, and all of you of being with us this afternoon, speaking about bone health and in the chapter of contraceptive treated women and in the chapter of menopause hormone therapy treated women. Dear, many thanks, Martin and John. Thanks to all of you. We are still 150 there. And then have a good afternoon. Goodbye to the next issue. It will be Tuesday, 16th of November. Thank you, dear friends.